Thank you. 
grater, a cat grater, and it was just running smoother and smoother, and the oil analysis was proving through the process of how the soot was cleaning up. It was pretty nice. Uh, it's very concentrated product. We, instead of going out and having it be a small bottle to treat 100 gallons, when we put this together, we actually brought into the lab, and we would have a one-gallon container all the way up to a 25-gallon container. We would put one ounce of the field treatment in, and we would go through and measure all the boiling points, the BTU value, the CT indexes, the gravity, uh, the nuclear aromatics, and see where we stood on the fuel. And whether you use one ounce to one gallon to one ounce to 23 gallons, it basically gave us the same effect on a base fuel all the way across the board. When it came to the 24-gallon and 25-gallon, we could see that the product was too diluted and things would definitely change. So it is very cost-effective in the long run. If you look at it, one 55-gallon drum will do 165,000 gallons of fuel. So a drum can last year. We also do have another formulation that we call our Clean Boost Max formula. It's designed to be used in diesel and gasoline, and it's actually a 1 to 4,000 ratio. So as you, one drum of the uh, max formulation will actually go to about 230,000 gallons of fuel. So it's uh, very concentrated as well. The difference is the EPA wouldn't allow the original diesel formula to be used for gasoline because of some of the O2 sensors and the catalytic converters that were in some of the newer cars like the BMWs and Mercedes. And so we come up with a new formula on the max. We retested it and passed with uh, flying colors, but it also works very well in diesel. Uh, this, again, just shows you the concentration level. I mean, if you have a 100-gallon over-the-road truck, uh, you only use four and a half ounces of the product. When we come to the, the table to build these, we were looking at a way not to be just another fuel treatment. There are so many different fuel treatments on the market, but these are what they call Chons-based formulas. And if you look that up, it's actually CHONS, which stands for carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. That's what 90% of the fuel treatments on the market are. We want a whole different uh, solution looking to go with what we call an organic metal. When we approached the EPA showing them that we were in a, a regular fuel treatment, they make you do different types of testing. If you have the regular five ingredients, you go test, everything's great. If you use your number, you're done. You don't have to do all the intensive testing. We actually had to get with Detroit, buy an engine, go down to Southwest Research, and, and load this machine up and run it for hours and weeks doing hot and load starts and doing what we call a 211B emissions process test to show that we wouldn't affect the human race, that we would actually make some claims of fuel economy and everything, and the, uh, the tests come out very positive. We do have all that's how we got to where we are. We are an organic metal product that is actually 211B verified through the EPA through 2015. Other things that make us a little different is your regular fuel treatments that are just the base ingredients of diesel don't have to go through the ETV test or the OTEQ uh, version of testing. We have worked very close with Detroit, Cummins, Cat, down at Southwest Research looking for injector failure testing, which we'll show you in a minute. Uh, ash buildup in the engine, efficiency, burn rate, and uh, we, we do have a lot of testing backing us and verifying it, and also a lot of field testing. Uh, the great thing about Clean Boost, depending on the formulation of your fuel, we also can work in biodiesels, whether it be a B5 or a B20. Uh, some of the testing uh, that's out there when you test biodiesels is that you reduce NOx gases, but do you reduce NOx particulates? And we'll show that in a slide coming up here. And we have a couple of versions depending if you're using an industrial type fuel in a plant or you're using a for a bunker fuel in a ship. Uh, number six, seven, or eight diesel fuel, we also have that option in our Clean Boost HFO. Now this test that we did that you see on the screen now is a stationary fuel 
page that you can see on the screen now. This is done down at Southwest Research Institute uh, with three trucks. We had a control truck and two test trucks. This, when you look at that 3.06%, depending on who is uh, looking at an SAE test, this is not fuel miles per gallon. This is fuel used by volume, which they call gravimetrical weight volume. So they take a truck and they put a five-gallon fuel tank on it. We run these three trucks through a test cycle, uh, measuring barometer and humidity, wind, and everything, driving performance, and they run a 20-mile course, then they run the 20 miles back, and then they weigh the fuel tank. Then they put the treated fuel in, they do the exact same testing on two of the trucks and leave a control truck, and they go back out and run those again, and they weigh the tank. By percentage, one plus or minus one percent of failure, we had 3.06 percent by weight, that really opened up the eyes of Southwest Research. This product really did do what we were claiming it did. Some of the other advantages during this testing process was the fuel, looking at the oils. And so as we run longer testing and soot control tests, we have oil analysis showing the more you run the fuel treatment, the less fuel soot, the better your oil analysis is working on when we do test analysis. And definitely the wear metals, because once you control soot, you can control the wear metals inside of an engine. We were talking earlier about NOx particulates. This was a test done down in Las Vegas with the school district. They've taken some buses. Uh, you can see on the we got two electronic and two mechanical options. Uh, Detroit Series 60s and the bottom ones, if I'm not mistaken, were some like six or eight B92s in these buses. What we ended up doing is they were running a biodiesel, creating a lot of NOx reduction on the gas side, but they had very high notches on the particulate matter side. The school district was concerned. City and Clark, uh, Clark County, Nevada was looking at a different option. We went in and tested the clean boost, and we actually reduced the, uh, the particulate matter coming out of the NOx side when they run biodiesel, and this was a big win-win for the school district and for the city. Uh, like we discussed yesterday, they continue to use this product. It's not a big option, but uh, you know they do go through a drum or two a month, and they've uh, they've been a continued user for about five years now on this product. This is a test that we've done down at Creech Air Force Base. Uh, they have a very large EPA fining issue down there. What they end up doing is the government will fine Creech Air Force Base because they have so many. The EPA actually comes in and fines them, even though it's all government entity. The EPA is saying, look, you've got 20 of these generators running on a target silo. You're creating so many emissions out there. We need to find you on your particular matter per a certain volume and a certain area. Well, Creech, uh, we've done some oil analysis for the Air Force for years. And they'd ask us to come down and maybe do some uh, testing on a five gas analyzer and look at how we could actually reduce the emissions across the board. So they picked uh, some equipment, some trucks, some generators, and we did some baseline testing, and then we did some uh, after baseline, after running the clean boost, and you'll see that uh, the screen coming up here, some of the uh, before and after effects. A John Deere grader, an F-650 carrier that carries targets and things out to the shooting range, Volvo front end loader, a big Sterling truck, and that 50 uh, kilowatt generator. Since this time, the Air Force has been running our product. They've had great success. Uh, they're not getting fined the $30,000 a month at this location. And as we were talking yesterday, we're actually moving forward into the local Utah Air Force Base after they've been running this for a year period. Had the success of the local Air Force Base here in Salt Lake City was actually in our office last week, and we discussed options of moving forward at this location has the same thing. A lot of the benefits of also fuel economy. Um, if I showed you the fuel economy chart that backs this up, I would almost be embarrassed because some of the numbers are so high and scary. And I ask them not to advertise this because some of the trucks ended up seeing a 50% increase because they were idling and dirty and they'd go from two miles a gallon to four and a half miles a gallon. And they were just, they were very happy with the results, but uh, we never go out and advertise that. We always try to stick between the 8 and 11 percent or 8 and 12 percent because that's 99 percent what we're seeing out in the marketplace if everything's okay on your uh, on your diesel trucks, your over-the-road trucks. Now, when in 2007, the government took away a lot of the uh, sulfur they made at uh, the refineries, they made all the manufacturers reduce their sulfur content to 15 parts per million. That created a lot of OEM issues with injectors and fuel systems. Caterpillar, Ford, Detroit, Cummins has all stepped up and said, we at least need 3,100 pounds per square inch under loads when diesel fuel for publicity on our injectors. Um, as you 
you can see, we went and picked up a base fuel over at a fine day refiner, a fine day truck stop here in town. And that fuel was 2,750 pounds per square inch at the load rate. We had the lab test. We put one ounce to 23 uh, gallons into the fuel, a 1 to 3,000 ratio. And we actually got 4,500 pounds per square inch, 4,550, which is very impressive. I kind of have a story, a personal story that backs this. I had a Ford power stroke that lost all the injectors. And I lost the fuel pump. And when Ford towed it in, uh, they actually threw a sample right out of the tank. And I was pretty impressed one know they were doing. And they have actually a low uh, lubricity tester that they use because they go through a lot of injector failures. And the gentleman come back and asked me what kind of fuel treatment we run because he's never seen any numbers this high. Usually it's a failure. If it didn't need 3,100 pounds, they might warranty your fuel issue, but they also might go after your fuel supplier where you bought your fuel. So uh, he was pretty impressed with what was happening using the uh, using the clean boost in the in a Ford pickup truck and still to this day uh, we're still driving the truck and it's been running good. This is another ASTM style test. This is looking at the injector balls. You look down and we magnify them of course and look at the different wear scar because of the ultra low sulfur. You can see on the left when you don't um, use the clean boost, you see that big wear scar and on the right side you can actually see the wear on the injector ball. Uh, given life, we, we got a couple of mine sites here in Utah that says their injector life's almost tripled just using uh, the additive with no other changes. So it's, uh, it's been good. We put a lubricity in it, uh, agent. We also use some water dispersant. This test you see on the screen right now, we had to use for storage facilities. On the left-hand side, you can see diesel fuel likes to go back to its natural state. Uh, all the hydrocarbons try to boil back together. It wants to go back to where it was before it was uh, cracked in the refinery and turned into from crude to uh, fuel. When you add the clean boost to it, it with the reflectance test, we keep those molecules separated. We try to keep the fuel stabilized. Uh, like the old stable product out on the market, clean boost is a very good stabilizer for diesel and gasoline because it helps control what Mother Nature is trying to do. And we had to do this for some marine applications that we uh, deal with because their storage tanks would have to be drained or flushed or cycled every six months. And when they're using the clean boost uh, down in the port of Long Beach right now, they don't have these issues. They actually can go a year to two years with no issues on their fuel and it's saving them a lot of money on waste disposal or cleaning the tanks because we're trying to control the hydrocarbon growth and the formation to go back to the solid. Now this will show you the testing we were talking about earlier about the British Thermal Unit and the cetane rating. We decided not to go after the cetane numbers on fuel because when you increase cetane, it's a great way to burn the fuel, but it changes your burn rate of how long it can burn in the combustion chamber. And the longer you hold that fuel from burning, or heat you create, which sometimes is a good option, but also creates a bad option on your exhaust gas temperatures on a turbo. So if you're looking at this on the baseline, on the left-hand side, we just took a number two diesel and we did all of our boiling points and gravities and, and sulfur and, and uh, cetane and the uh, BTU value. We added our clean boost on the right-hand side. You can see a lot of the numbers weren't affected. The cetane come down very low because you have fluctuation in your testing equipment at plus or minus 5, uh, 0.5, so that wasn't too bad. But the BTU value went up almost 2,200, a little over 2,200. What that ended up doing is creating more energy in the fuel and making the fuel burn at an earlier stage instead of using cetane improvers to create a, a longer burn cycle. Now, cetane improvers are usually a product which we call 2-EHN, or scientifically a 2 exyl hexyl nitrate. What it actually is is it's an alcohol base formula that they put into a lot of winter blend fuel. I know here in Salt Lake City area in Wyoming, come wintertime, they add this in right around November 1st and they run the 2 gen all the way down in the blended fuel until about uh, March 15th to March 30th and then they start to pull that out. That's why you see a lot of fuel economy loss in the winter in a diesel because they've changed the way that they blended the fuel so there's not so much gelling issues for uh, trucking companies and agriculture going across the nation depending on the different climate. Using the Clean Boost uh, product in winter blend fuel is a great thing. It helps uh, control a little bit of the pull points. But what it actually does is try to stabilize that mileage a little bit. So if you were getting six and a half miles a gallon without fuel treatment, and then you drop down to four in the winter, you still might get back up to six with the Clean Boost in there because it helps fight with that uh, 2EHN and stabilize the fuel to burn a little different instead of fighting so much of the high cetane number. A lot of uh, winter companies do quite a bit. Uh, I've got some construction companies up in Alaska that just love the product because uh, 
Honduras. I mean, over 60% of the world's Pepsi is made in Honduras, believe it or not. And how they do this is the World Bank tries to finance the electric companies that run the plants down there. Well, their emissions were so high that by World Bank standards, they could not fund this plant to run and generate the electricity for Pepsi. And uh, so we actually went down there and uh, looked at the situation and took one of our fuel treatments, uh, our bunker fuel out of it there, and we've actually uh, made a good ally with them because we run the test, got through all of their baseline testing and then emission testing, and the World Bank turned around and funded Pepsi for a couple more years. One criteria is they have to use our product. You can see on the left-hand side that soot coming out. Now, that is an operational soot. That is what they're doing right there is they're blowing down the plant. They're trying to clean up all the turbos, clean off all the carbon deposits. So they bring the plant down to 40% and just put a load on the engines and try to clean it out. What ends up happening is the parking lot full of cars and little blocks and miles away gets covered in soot. After 250 hours of runtime on the right-hand side, that's that same 40% download and this is what we were doing was opacity testing and emission testing on these plants and uh, they determined that the, uh, the clean boost we actually call it now clean boost nanotain the carbon x used to be the old name but we run it forever that's why we've left it up there on the screen because we used to call it the uh, carbon x but somebody stole that name down in india from us and we don't want it to go back and forth this is the engines inside there there's a very large man engine that come out of england and they're just they're very large as you can see cylinder on one and a couple guys doing a rebuild. Uh, when my partner was down there, he said it was very interesting as they were uh, rebuilding one of the big engines. This is the plumbing and injection system we actually hooked up while we were down there. On the left-hand side, you can see that there was nothing, no interruptions. We built this nice little injection system so we could put a ball valve. And then down here on this middle slide, you'll see that uh, silver 24-inch injection pipe. This product that they run for fuels like tar, it's a number six to number eight bunker fuel, very, very heavy viscous. Well, they have to heat it in the furnace, and as they're heating it in the furnace, it has to stay uh, in the liquid before it gets to the engine, so it can actually burn in the combustion chamber. And if it's too far from the engine, it'll get back to solid, and it creates a lot of problems in the engine as it's trying to burn. So our additive actually keeps it separated, so after it comes through the process of the heat, we inject it in off of the 55-gallon drum and an air pump off of the flow rate, and each amount of the fuel has been treated at 1 to 5,000. The results were much cleaner emissions, but they're also seeing fuel savings. It was pretty amazing, even though these things burn 1,000 gallons an hour between the engines. They were seeing some anywhere from 2 to 4 percent, if you look at the report. Fuel economy was just saved in thousands of dollars each month because the fuel consumption on these big ends. Some of the other benefits you'll see is the injector tips are cleaner. And like we talked yesterday on the turbo rings, each and every 35 to, or 30 to 45 days they have to tear the turbos apart, steam clean them, uh, clean all the hydrocarbons, all the soot off of them, rebuild the turbos, put them back together, and then run the unit. So this was a good, uh, it was very, very time consuming. And they'd have to shut down an engine. Well, right now they're doing annual turbo cleaning since they've been running the fuel treatment. It actually helps stabilize it. So they've had some good luck there as well. This is a project that, uh, like I said, my partner was doing in Canada. We just wanted to show some marine applications. They actually seen 3.7% fuel economy on this big ship. Uh, still in the stay there. They run four of these ships over there. Uh, they run a number six bunker fuel, and uh, they've been using our nanotape product and, and seeing great results. Another group that we've dealt with is we are heavily getting into the mining. We work with Rio Tinto. We work with Barry Gold right now on some very large testing projects. Uh, we were discussing with Barry Gold. They actually come to 25 companies and ask all of them to do a proposal on fuel treatment, and they would choose which fuel treatment they would like to test on their dump. And 25 companies presented. They narrowed it down to 10, and they narrowed it down to 3, and we actually met the criteria because of the EPA backing. On our fuel treatment, we went and did testing up in Canada with a government-tested lab in Ottawa, Canada, right outside of Toronto, and they've had very good results. They've been telling us they're not sharing a lot yet, but we are on the fourth stage of testing now because they've had different types of fuels made, and now we're testing the Shell fuel, we're testing the Exxon Mobil fuel, and the Sinclair fuel, and uh, they're on their fourth round of testing on March 23rd. They'll run one more go, and they'll decide uh, and how the results are. They're seeing fuel economy. They're definitely seeing maintenance improvements. And there again, the injector failure 
issues I've been working with the mind site here in Salt Lake to talk about it. Um, another, we had a group in here yesterday uh, that's uh, a big drilling company that's up in North Dakota. They've got so many drilling rigs in that new pocket of uh, oil that they're drilling in gas that they are creating a lot of emissions. And this group has been running uh, these big cat engines and they're buying our fuel treatment through a private label because we do private label for a few groups. And uh, they've had, they were sharing some results yesterday. They cannot believe the success they're having on reduction of emissions just off those rigs, let alone the maintenance that oil. They're extending their oil drains from uh, 300 hours to 500 hours, and that's all oil field related. They're just, they're very, very happy with the results. Uh, we're trying to hook up some filtration systems for them on the safe go around, see if we can extend their oil even to 1,000 hours, because we do have some case studies showing that. And we work with a lot of different labs. This OLS labs, uh, they're a worldwide lab. They do a lot of our testing on fuels to, for third-party verification. This is uh, one of the formulas that we actually make is a marine formula. But some of the things when people change over from biodiesel to diesel and back and forth, we were taking pictures inside of a tank to show if, if you've been running number two diesel and you just go ahead and run a B20 or a B5, this is type of the growth you build in the bottom of your tank unless you treat it or use some kind of a biocide additive. So that's just a slide we put in here to kind of, I know biodiesels are becoming very popular, just be very, very careful switching over because your tanks can get very, very contaminated and create problems. On the number two diesel, when you measure water, we measure it in what we call a Carl Fisher. It's a type of test that looks for moisture parts per million. So we've taken some base diesel fuel and you can see the parts per million. We had a lab, the DLS lab, do this. And you can actually see that by just adding our additive, we reduced the particulate matter 37% on the water. Now this is one of our formulas we've discussed. We have a formula that grabs the water molecule, the particulate, and makes it part of the fuel. It encapsulates it and it emulsifies within the fuel so it can pass through the fuel system. A lot of companies don't like that. They like to have a product that drops it to the bottom of the tank. So there's two different options depending on if you're in a marine application or you're in a very humid climate with a lot of moisture, we can give you either option. That's why we like to look at the fuel first that we would be using for your corporation or your option to see how the water content is and what does the fuel look like because fuel from north to south, east to west is totally manufactured different so there's a lot of different results you can get. This is a B5 uh, biodiesel and you can see we reduced it 23%, pretty amazing because there is a lot of water in biodiesel. And then you get up to the B20, you can see over 160 parts per million water. Just adding our clean boost in, we've reduced it about 11% just on the particular. So it's, we do have some water dispersion additives in it. This is the pictures done in the lab. You can see this is 95 milliliters of very dirty water that come out of the tank. With the diesel, you can see how the water settled on the bottom. We mix the ratio in up to 98 milliliters, shook up the beacon, and come back six hours later, and this is what it looked like. Down to 94 milliliters, it encapsulated the water, and lo and behold, uh, the fuel cleaned up pretty good. So the additive does work for water dispersion, but it also works with all the other benefits in case you're in that type of an atmosphere. Marine's very heavy, and uh, definitely down, the, down south in the very humid areas, we see a lot of that. Now, we, we talked about our fuel pills. We actually have a fuel pill that started out as a novelty thing, but it turned out to be a pretty good mover. This fuel pill is the same technology. The only difference is you don't have the lubricity factor you have in liquid. One of our pills will treat up 16 gallons of fuel. Diesel or gasoline, so that's a big advantage. And the reason we developed these, as I tell, like I told Chuck, is my wife spilled some of the liquid in the back of her SUV, and it really smelled funny. So she always asked, you that you can't build a pill. Well, the product actually starts out as a powder before we start building it anyway, so we decided to get some bonding agents and do some testing with a vitamin manufacturer and make the pills, dissolved them, tested them, and we got some great results. The one gram pill treated up 15 gallons of fuel. Uh, most of our customers that buy these are for gas applications. So do we're great in diesel, but you do lose the lubricity effect that you need for your injectors on the ultra low sulfur. A lot of the EPA testing we've had to do is, is this product safe? It's an organic iron compound. Uh, how does it work? Like I discussed earlier in the slides, we have been 211B tested. EPA has been with us from day one, making sure we report everything we're doing. If we sell this product, we get audits every quarter we send in to let them know how much we're selling of it across the nation, not to our customers and their names, just how many of the organic metals we sell. And the reason for that is it's a very unique process to get this tested. They don't like it, organic metals being out in the marketplace, but where we test a very positive and oxidation reduction, emission reduction, they're okay with it, but we do report and keep a close tabs with EPA on that. So the, the product isn't very harmful to 
description like you cannot believe. The product is non corrosive non-flammable. It can be used, like I said, with any engine or any gear oil. It's compatible with synthetics and petroleum base. It's a very, very low viscous. Um, Exxon Mobil is, is discussed with us how the heck did we develop this and have it work because they didn't know how we bonded all these metal atoms together to make it work. But it's been fun. It is truly a nanotechnology, and we've, uh, we've had some good success with it in the racing industry and over the world truck industry. Any types of solids like your Teflons or your borons, and so it's it's very very safe to use on engines. Any type of uh, it doesn't adhere to titanium, but it does attach to all iron components, your camshaft, timing gears, crank rods, and uh, it's very very thin thin coat, so thin it's uh, less than 10 microns, and it creates reduced temperatures and on uh, sliding surfaces. You can see the friction reduction. One of the big advantages is when you're doing oil analysis, you watch the wear metals reduce, whether it be in an engine application or a gear application. We have a case study on a differential that had about 1,142 parts per million iron. After running the additive in the same period of time, it was reduced all the way down to 400 parts per million. And the truck drivers that were running the product said they noticed a temperature reduction in their differentials and transmissions. They were very happy. Like we discussed, it's not EPA targeted for any reason because there is no Teflons or paraffins or esters in it. Definitely no chlorinated products like all other competition. There is some great products on the marketplace that are anti-friction reduction options. They work great, but they're 99% chlorine. And when you put a chlorine additive into an engine and you create heat, you create hydrochloric acid, especially when you put a little moisture from combustion process. That's why these things are great short-term oil additives, but they're not great long-term effects. They start destroying and pitting the engine. They dry out seals. They dry out gaskets. And that's why we've developed something that was very friendly with seals, very friendly with all oils. Uh, we've had to pass a lot of different seal tests for the manufacturers to be okay with it. And uh, as we take it down and hook it into a facility and do this rubber testing, we test Viton, rubber, neoprene, every type of seal to make sure of the expansion ratios. So we're not, you know, uh, shrinking or heating up or creating crystallization of a rear main seal or a valve stem seal. So it's a big plus. We have an oil additive. So say you have a 40 quart system, you would actually fill it up on the ratio, uh, end up putting about 64 ounces in it. What ends up happening is you overfill your distic tube. Your distic mounts a little high, of course, on your sump. As you drive the vehicle, it actually starts to adhere to the metal, and once it gets up to operating temperature, a couple hundred miles down the road, if you stop to check your oil, you'd be back down to your original 40, because this is actually adhering to the asparagus in the middle. And we'll kind of show you. These are, of course, different applications that we've used the metal plus in. Uh, very, very heavy. I don't know if anybody on the phone's in the drag racing, but that's one of our side things we do. We've got a lot of the professional NHRA drag racing companies that just love the additive because it's helping protect their engines from those big nitro 8,000 horsepower options. And uh, this, in fact, we, uh, we had a guy racing in Florida this weekend that stressed because he ran out of it, and he actually paid next day FedEx to get a bucket, a five-gallon bucket of it down to Florida. And I got to tell you, he must really need it because it was $475 freight to get it there. And he just, he didn't care. He said he had to have it before he started it. His engine is $100,000. He said he didn't care. Get the stuff down here. And so he thought he had it in his trailer and his crew chief didn't bring it. So he was a little stressed out. This can be great. We have a lot of companies that are in manufacturing that buy this product for their big gearboxes and their conveyor belts because it does reduce gear temperature. Um, so it, it is a multi-purpose treatment, but it was developed for an engine back in the day for the railroad for the EMD diesels. But uh, we're using it in all of our applications. We even make specialty new greases called the Metal Plus Grease. That we have a version where we put five percent of our metal treatment, and then we have a version that we put eighteen percent in. And these are what we call super greases. They are very good chassis greases and bearing greases. Uh, a lot of the drag racers that have open uh, bearing surfaces for their race car wheels and, and uh, all their front and wheel, uh, rear hubs, they actually buy the grease because they think they get a reduction on uh, friction. And every little bit counts when you're going uh, 300 miles an hour, so they're pretty excited about it. And we talked, uh, we do not have a case study on fuel consumption. Uh, we talked about this yesterday. I do have uh, some verbiage that people that put it into their over the road trucks have uh, seen anywhere from 2 to 4 percent. But we just, we don't have a true case study, so we don't have anything in printing. But uh, I 
can verify in the, in the one ton pickup I've seen at least 3% right out of the gate after about three 400 miles. And I use the one ton to pull some big trailers and it's kind of nice. I do notice in my differentials I've got a lot lower temperature operating temperatures, but also in the engine. Um, I've been using this from day one and my engine temperatures are always running 10, 15 degrees lower than whatever uh, my diesel used to run. After I've been putting it in, I've got a friend with the exact same power stroke, same thing that tows a trailer, and I'm always 10, 15 degrees lower on my temperature under load, so it's kind of funny, but I'm also running the clean boost fuel treatment, which definitely helps. This is a film strength test that we've had to go to the market and show that the product truly really is a, um, a metal conditioner. This is a testing machine that we use in an ASTM testing machine right here in our lab. You can look just using a standard metal uh, motor oil without the metal plus. You can see how many weights we got. Each one of these weights are pounds per square inch. If you end up putting all 20 weights on a machine, you're about 200,000 pounds per square inch. When we've come back and added the metal plus to that same engine oil, you can see what happens. Uh, we actually max out the machine as much as 650% friction reduction. When you go in and actually calculate that out on that pinpoint of that bearing that it's loading on, it's about 200,000 pounds per square inch. Uh, we did a test here yesterday for that oil field company, and they brought their motor oils in, they were using them, they're big cats, and we did a load rate, and they made it to four weights. They were happy. I took a little stencil of full of the metal plus, put it in the machine, looked at the handle, put it back down, and we went by all 20 weights, and it just sat there and run and run and run, and they were pretty impressed to see that this might help on drilling because these engines are torquing so hard. Uh, this is some bearing wear that you can see that we took the pictures after doing that test where metal plus with, uh, with the motor oil is 210,000 pounds per square inch. A high quality motor oil is about 2,200 pounds per square inch. And just your basic off the shelf oil we can buy at any Walmart or, or grocery store is about 150 pounds per square inch. So you can see by adding this to a regular base motor oil, it's become, uh, it really makes the oil to come to the next level. How metal plus works is it likes heat pressure and of course time. The more heat you apply to it, the better it reacts. And you can do, see that in the testing we've done on these low rate machines. Uh, in the engines, in the trucking industry, and in the race car engines, the more heat, the more pressure they put on this, this product is active. And what it's doing is grabbing the asperities of the metals and putting them back into the grooves, the asperities inside the metal that's grabbing the ferrous particles. Now this is a drawing I've done that shows a little bit. It's not much of a but if you had a surface of metal you were looking at and you looked down inside of a cylinder, it would look like mountain ranges. And what we're doing is taking these parts from billion of these ferrocene that's off of the cylinder's well, off the crank, and we're trying to apply them back in and filling these to make a smoother coefficient sliding of the surface, which makes it the reduced friction compound makes it a nice win-win across the board. This is some testing that we had done at a lab, a Harris Testing Labs in Houston and the Dallas area, actually, where they've taken the uh, mobile oil, Quaker oil, Castro, and they did load rate testing. They took our metal plus at 100%. You can see we're at 0.02 thousandth of an inch, which, when adding it to these oils, it changes these oils. And these are oils given to us from some racers and a couple of trucking companies to see if we could really change the wear scar rate. That kind of involves the chemical side of life and kind of shows where we're at. I mean, we do offer a bunch of other items, but those are our two main uh, signature series products that Chuck wanted to discuss today and kind of review. We, we've been doing this. We've been involved with a lot of lawsuits across the world with different oil manufacturers, different oil additive companies. And when we come to the table and we know that history of being involved in the lab business, we wanted to build something that would come to market that we'd feel comfortable with and make sure before we introduced it to the OEMs or we introduced it that we did our own internal testing. Uh, we have a lot of help with Southwest Research and uh, labs up in Canada. The government testing lab in Ottawa is going to be a uh, part of our testing. So when we come to the market, we feel comfortable giving you a product and we stand behind them. We've got some great warranty uh, claims and some great insurance options in case something does ever happen. Uh, we stand by our products pretty deep. Well, that's good. Uh, any questions, thoughts, or, you know, the other thing is we got a little bit of time we can go through part of the filtration.
complaints were looking for a dissenting unit. So we teamed up with a group called DTI, which is a good group. They come to the table and build us a nice little unit, but it was around $3,500. And we just kind of laughed because we couldn't go out to the trucking firms and say, hey, we want to sell fuel treatment to you and you're going to get benefits. But the ROI for injector systems, so 3500 a whack, was a little high. So we've been working and we bought some stainless steel. We got with a welding group that built our shoulder houses for us and had them design some nice three-gallon tanks and some six-gallon tanks that we can mount on the truck. Uh, the only thing I have right now, because we haven't officially launched it, is I do have a YouTube video that shows us testing uh, the injection system showing if you put in 100 gallons of fuel or you put in 150 gallons of fuel, you hit this keypad. And the keypad can be in your truck because we've got two versions, a plug-in and a wireless one. And you just type in 150 when you get back in the cab, the system automatically doses enough fuel treatment to do 150 gallons. So if you had a three-gallon container, that three gallons is going to do about, what, 9,000 gallons of fuel. So it'll last you quite a while across the, uh, across the nation or across the option. We're trying to keep this piece to the, uh, to the end users around $1,000. Uh, the reason being we're not going to make a lot of money on it. We just want to be able to offer a way so there is more return on investment for the fuel treatments. Uh, we do have a little bit of and they're nice. Explain what they're made of and why you made them. Well, we, we made them all out of stainless steel, so they were more bulletproof because of the DTI group trying to discharge a lot of money. And there again, we were wanting to make sure they could go on a truck or they could go into mining industry. That's why we're building the six-gallon ones, because we have a lot of the cat mining groups saying, if you could mount that on a dozer and do the same thing, we would be very interested in having the fuel treatments because it's hard to get the fleet guys to use the product. Um, not the owners. The owners are happy, but the truck drivers are taking it home and putting it in their own vehicles. And so the, the usage of the fuel treatments through the roof but the, the owners of the company aren't seeing the benefits because they'll give them to dose a bottle of sitting behind the seat or in a sleep that just isn't really working. So that's why and, and you're not going to and, and that's, that's been the problem. So uh, unless you're a carrier that, that does 90% of your fueling at a, at a, you know, at their facility, doesn't really benefit over their own, their own company. Um, and that's, we've noticed that. That's what we've done with Smithfield Foods. They're one of our biggest end users of product. They have been for five years. The great thing with them in Tar Hill, North Carolina, is they get delivered every single day 7,500 gallons of fuel between these facilities. So what we actually did for them is our distributor in North Carolina went and had two and a half gallon custom bottles fluorinated, jugs fluorinated, and he'll buy drums with the produce, put two and a half gallons in those containers, and he'll go to Smithfield Foods, which is owned by Sierra England now, and they'll drop these containers off 10 at a time. So every day when the fuel trucks come in, it's like clockwork, two and a half gallons, treat 7,500 gallons, they just dump it in there, and then they recycle these containers. So they got 10 that the groups have, and then they have 10 back in their warehouse, and they just recycle like a core. And it's worked out that way. If you look at the video on our homepage, you'll see that container. Uh, that's actually Smithfield Foods dosing their tanks. And the fuel truck shows up, and uh, they've had some great success with the product. We have some case studies. A gentleman named Gary Bradshaw was the uh, food director there, and he's been very, very helpful throughout the years running the fuel treatment, and of course, he's bypass filters on his trucks. And he sent me an oil sample report with 120,000 miles on it, and I about fell over. And I didn't know that I had 120,000 on it until he told me. I just run the sample, so it looks like pretty good oil, and he said, good, I have 120,000 on it. And I just, wow. I, I, and that's because the fuel slips were down, and he was controlling the other contaminations with the filter, and uh, he's had some good success with it, so it's been a fun, fun battle with him for sure.
far as the additive on the oil, now that's something that that could happen. I'm just I'm not sure as far as our maintenance is concerned. Uh, that would be our, our maintenance director, Chuck. I think I mentioned and gave you his right. name. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that might be something that that could be a possibility. I'm not sure how much oil changes we get or or have to do over the road, but. I would imagine that we, we cut our costs there and try to do those here uh, or, or at, a, at a maintenance facility. We have two of those. Um, right. The good thing on the additive, you, you can add it into the vehicle itself, or if you do have bulk storage and you know how much is in there, you can actually put it in. But I do like adding it in the truck because you can put it before or after on the oil change, and once the truck starts, it's already agitated and going through the system. So.
the stamp of the money charge eighty five grand. We just we just don't see that being an option right now because it's for a little stamp. But I have, we got a lot of CJ four users buying our oil and just loving it. They've done it in all their vehicles, so we got some good luck that way. So we have an additive, but I can be honest, our oil is probably a whole bunch more than what a large fleet would be buying Delo or Chevron for or uh Rotella for. So well, the filtration thing, talk about filtering new oil. I mean, we haven't got into the oil filter side of things, but um, but I think going through that a little bit and talking about why new oil is dirty oil and filtering it can extend oil life. Yeah, we're actually doing that at a mine site right now, and we're actually doing that down at the uh, Air Force Base. So I'll go through these screens real quick and I'll talk about each one. But we do do a two micron filtration, and uh, this is a unique filter that is designed in England, and now it's made right here in Salt Lake City. Oh yeah, we ended up buying the company and bringing it over here because it is such a unique bypass filter. There's no added impacts, there's no heating elements. I mean, it's just an in and an out. And to be honest, the food sauce is that element. But this kind of gives you an idea of what you're talking about, Chuck. This is on a plastic manufacturing plant. You can see on the left-hand side, that was the oil from all the moisture. We told them not to change the oil. I installed the filter. We run it for a few months, come back and look at the oil, and you can see how clean it was. During this time, I was doing oil analysis and part of me to keep track of it. That was just amazing to see the results. So what we're doing right now for the military and for some other options is we build these filter cards. When their oil shows up from their supplier, yeah, it looks clean, but it, it truly is not a clean oil. There's a lot of particulate matter, either from the drum or the manufacturing process. Not that it's dirty to a point you can't use it, but it's definitely dirty oil. We just don't see it because it's microscopically dirty. But what we've been doing is running our filter cards on oils that come into the military and up here at this mine site and circulating them with our filter cards for three to four to five hours and doing a before and after oil analysis on the particle count. When we do that, they are actually extending their oil drains because they're meeting their ISO codes. Longer because we've cleaned the oil up three to four times than it was when it came in in the drum, brand new or in the tote. And so what Caterpillar has done is their ISO code in a bind site is when your oil reaches a 2120 ISO code, you have to drain it or it's not warrantyable. Well, the oil, when it comes in from the manufacturer, is about an 1815 ISO code if you're using the old 2 code, 4406 code. Well, we take our silver card and clean it. We get it down to 1411, which is as clean as aviation hydraulic oil. Now that customer or the mine site can actually run their long, long-term cycles and extend their oil drains from 350 hours to 500 without blinking an eye. They're very happy with it. But we're also looking for other failures. We're not fuel diluting it from a bad injector or a cooler leak or an oil cooler. So oil analysis is important because we're also not just looking at the oil condition. We're looking at other engine issues that could happen. And, you know, Mike, you see a lot of, you know, coppers and oil cooler failures. It's going to wash out the fuel or your oil right away, so it's very important to watch for those. But if your truck's running decent, your equipment's all right, and you have a loss in injector and oil cooler, we've got guys that are extending their drains up to 50,000 miles without filtration because they've cleaned the oil up beforehand. So it, it is kind of unique how it works. And uh, we've built different types of carts. Here's a picture of the military right here. Uh, you can see in the left hand bottom, this is a hydraulic service unit that we're doing on a road grader. This is our filter cart. We're just sitting there, we got one hose in, one hose out. We're sitting there circulating about a 90 gallon hydraulic tank. And uh, they've just, that hydraulic fluid has over 4,000 hours on it now. It just never gets drained because it's so clean. This is the engine in this Volvo uh, rotor uh, that we've done. And we hooked our filter up and we just got it sitting there circulating. You see the main oil filter and we got our bypass filter. This is a different picture Oops, on the uh, right hand side of it from further back. They're changing this filter element every 250 hours on this, but they used to change the oil every 250 hours. They're up at about 1,800 hours at the military base down there, pre j space. The money they're saving alone on just oil changes is paying for these filters right out of the gate and last in the next 30 days. Their oil life come back to them so quick they're very excited. Because all they have to do is, we, they're not even replacing the main filter anymore 
water removal, whether it's a mostly side or dispersed water, because of the media. And it is the most amazing filter we've ever seen, trying to put it together. And uh, we've been doing testing with Costco and mine sites, and they just literally do not believe we're removing 100% of the water in one pass. This is our motor oil, showing scuff wear on the different oils, uh, bearing wear on the pistons, using our clean boost oils, and all of that. So there's, there's some great stuff that we're into. I'm very much into maintenance and saving dollars across there because I was a fleet director for a long time in Wyoming. Everybody in the world would come and give me their ideas, and so I had to decide how to start testing some of them, and now we're actually that guy trying to do the ideas for you guys. Uh, a one fuel facility is not going to... No, no, but the, the, the question is, is how do you amortize the cost of the onboard unit so that it makes enough sense, so that, so that you're not taking a hit of, of if you got 4,000 tractors, you know, that's a $400,000 hit in a day if you bought them all. The question is, is, is how do you get them to pay for yourself? Because, you know, one of our philosophies is, is, is spend management. How do you sit there and reduce your spend and, 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 and still have things pay for themselves? And, uh, and so that's something we'll work on, but I, I think that, uh, you know, we, uh, we'll prove that, that uh, you're reducing your spend in certain areas, and that'll more than pay for the dispensary. And so but that's just something we got to work on and make sure that we're looking at the same spreadsheets and numbers and with the same expectations. Well, great. Well, I sure appreciate everybody's time. I know it's Thursday and it's late for a lot of us, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank if you have any questions, get back with us, and thanks for your time, guys. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Mike, I'll get back to you shortly.